Welcome to Voice of San Diego at Home. It is Wednesday, May 20th. Wednesday, May 20th in this new weird reality that we are living with. I'm Scott Lewis. I'm the CEO and Editor-in-Chief at Voice of San Diego. I have a great show today. Finally got really prepared. We have a great guest. We have Dr. Rebecca Fielding Miller, a UC San Diego epidemiologist and assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health. Cannot possibly have found a better guest for today. She's going to come in and talk. We're taking questions. We already have a ton of questions, uh, so we will uh, look for that. Uh, I'm very excited that she joined us today. Let's go through a couple. Oh, hey, there she is. <laughs> Hold on. Hello. I'll bring you on. <laughs> I'll go through a couple of um, uh, uh, notes from our uh, news of the week. Um, so first off, it is working. Uh, it is uh working our push to get people to go outside with their activities <laughs> in maryland here is the restaurant fish tails they have come up with tables bumper tables keep people apart and outside <laughs> uh andy keith on our staff is from maryland says this is not the best restaurant in that little area cheap knock he says but look at that how many places have bumper tables like that uh, i don't know if that's going to work but we will check uh See if other people can do that here. Uh, here's our guest. She's coming on in a minute, Dr. Rebecca Fielding Miller. I didn't mean to hide her. Uh, nobody puts uh, Dr. Fielding Miller in the corner, but we're going to uh, do a couple of notes. First off, we talked um, on Monday about schools and, and about the situation with schools and how worried we are about schools. And some of the news, uh, you remember San Diego Unified School District and five other school districts announced uh, that they don't think that in good conscience, they could open up schools if lawmakers agree with the governor and cut 10% of their budgets. They think they need more money, not less. And if they don't get the uh, more money, then, then they don't think they can open the physical space this fall. We talked to Richard Barrera, trustee at the school district, who reiterated that, said, we think we can open in the physical space this fall but not if they cut our budget. I don't know how much of this is brinkmanship, but it's giving me heartburn. It is giving me nightmares. Uh, that got worse today. The UT followed up our piece on uh, Tuesday about it, and Wednesday had our, had the story up. Their quote of Barrera was this. He said, if they don't, if they do get those cuts and they don't get more money, then uh, it's going to be distance learning this fall. And this is how he put it. It would be a lesser version of what we're doing now and what we're doing now is extremely stressful for students parents teachers and staff a lesser version of distance learning yeah <laughs> that means maybe they just send people to your house and yell at you about how bad you are at this i don't know how it can get lesser i don't know what is going to happen uh, so hopefully they figure that out and, and provide something. Maybe the, the problem is, is that he says it's all dependent on the Senate, the U S Senate passing the house bill for relief for States and local governments. I think there's a possibility that a bill gets done, but I don't know if it's anything close to what Democrats imagine in the U S house. And if we're dependent on that to open schools in the fall, well, that is a scary prospect. We will talk to Dr. Fielding Miller, Miller about her thoughts about kids and schools. Um, okay, another bit of news fascinating in our in Voice of San Diego today. Lisa Halverstadt took the pulse of the tourism industry. They're excited to start marketing for people to come to San Diego who are already in San Diego. Um, she, uh, but she, she realized there was some confusion. There's some hotels that are clearly taking people who aren't essential workers or being isolated or whatever, just people who need a change of scenery. Helen Robbins Meyer, the chief administrative officer of the County of San Diego, clarified Tuesday that that's not allowed. The county doesn't expect the state to lift tourism restrictions until the final stage of its four phase reopening plan, which is right there along with concerts and full stadiums for sports, which is way far along. Uh, we are in stage two barely right now if they let us. But tourism authority data indicates that hotel room bookings are on the rise in San Diego. During the final week of April, hoteliers saw an additional 17,000 bookings than it had the previous week. And during the week of May 3rd, they saw a spike of another 15,000 nightly bookings. 
compared to the previous week. Bill Evans from Evans Hotels, you know, the Catamaran, Bahia, Torrey Pines Lodge, all those places. He says his hotels have remained open to serve essential workers, but he's seeing more staycationers. He said, quote, they can shelter in a hotel room just like they can shelter in their condo. I think it's for a change of scenery. It's for mental health purposes. Wow. Wow. So another round of dissonance between the county public health guidance and what is actually happening and what people think is happening. Uh, hotels are closed, but they're open and people are going to them even though they're not supposed to. I don't know what's happening. It's fascinating. Uh, another moment of of um, a dissonance between uh, what's being said, messaging out there, all that. We got a lot to talk about. All right, I am going to bring on Dr. Rebecca uh, Fielding Miller. Uh, so let me get time. my headphone on. <laughs> so I can hear. Dr. Fielding Miller, hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. Let's just take a second and explain to the people who you are. What do you do uh, every day at UC San Diego? Well, I'm a professor of infectious disease and global health at UCSD. So previously that looked a lot like um, people asking me to look at their rash when they didn't quite understand what <laughs> epidemiology was or what kind of doctor I was. Um, but now it involves a lot of talking about COVID-19 and why you probably shouldn't go to a hotel room. Um, <laughs> Tell us why. Because why? you're bored standing at your own four walls. You know, I think actually one of the biggest risks um, to a hotel room would not necessarily be to you. Um, I would worry about the staff at the hotel room. So the more people touching more things, sneezing on more things, um, the higher the risk to the people who have to change those bed linens and and bring you food and take care of you as you get some mental health benefits. So for me personally, I would not do that. Yeah, but you uh, came to my attention because you did post something about, we do need to accommodate some mental health mm -hmm. uh, benefits that we, we are going to start to transition to a um, living with the risk type of situation. So describe, you actually have worked for years studying HIV in Africa and mm -hmm. in other places. So talk about uh, what you know about infectious diseases and, and, mm -hmm. and, and just what we need to be thinking about as we, as we transition to living with the risk. Yeah, so I, I, by training, I'm a social epidemiologist, which means I think about all the ways that um, sort of our, our social lives and our society affect our risk of getting sick. Um, a lot of the times it turns out that um, if you are poor, you are at higher risk of being sick. And I would say about 60% of my job boils down to that. Um, but I've spent a lot of time um, sort of working in sub-Saharan Africa um, around HIV, um, and thinking about kind of this intersection of um, social and economic inequality and how that really drives the risk. And one thing that we have really learned in about 30 plus years of working with a virus which um, manifests slowly and spreads quickly and is transmitted socially and has no vaccine is that one of the best ways you can, can, you can contain it is by knowing your status, knowing the status of your network um, and and um, kind of just constant testing. Um, testing has been the mantra um, in the HIV field for a really long time, know your status. And I think there's a lot of overlap with COVID-19 because we know that in the first few days before you have any symptoms um, is probably when you're the most infectious. Um, we know that a lot of people don't show symptoms for a very long time, if ever. And one of the only strategies that we have to sort of um, break those chains of transmission is people knowing their status early and um, not being within six feet of other people um, uh, as soon as possible. Okay, so I asked for questions from the audience and we got a bunch to go through. Mm -hmm. And um, please, if you're on the uh, on the feed right now, what do you want to know? What risks are you worried about? What do you, what kinds of things can we run by the doctor? And she can she can admit when she doesn't know, I, I would I would assume. <laughs> I will. Uh, I and, will and we have a, but I wanted before we got into some of those questions, so uh, post them here on the feed. Uh, you can also post them um, uh, in in the Twitter. I'm at VOSD Scott. I'll check that out as well. So one of the things I wanted you to explain was testing. I, we've been we mounted a testing tracker on the site, the voice of San Diego.org, because we wanted, if they said we needed 5,200 tests per day, well, then what are we doing to get there? Let's keep track of mm -hmm. that. Uh, 
and people ask me all the time, like, what does testing matter? And what does the positive rate matter and all that such? And I, and I, I fumble through, I think, a pretty good explanation, but I bet you mm -hmm. have a better one. So <laughs> when somebody asks, why, why is testing such a big deal? What can you do to explain that? You said, know your status, but, uh, but why is, what's, what's happening with all that? Yeah, so testing, um, especially in February and March, I want to say the beginning, but I feel like time just has no meaning at this point. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but <laughs> one of the reasons really early on why we wanted to push testing is we needed to know how big the problem was. You cannot even begin to address a problem if you don't understand its scale. And so um, testing was a way that we could begin to get a sense of how much of an outbreak do we have in the county. Um, as things move forward and testing capacity uh, grew and we had a reasonable sense of where we were, testing can also let us know um, sort of how quickly is this, um, is COVID-19 taking off? So how many more people are getting sick each day? Um, is it safe for us to um, go out and see one another in public in an open space or do we all need to stay home? So it gives us a sense of the speed. And for individuals, um, it lets you know um, if you need to maybe stay home to protect other people. So for example, um, is it safe for you to go and get an elective but important procedure at the hospital? Testing lets you know that it is safe. Now, as we kind of move into, I don't know, we're at the end of the beginning. Is that one phrase that we're using a lot? Sure. The thing that needs to go with testing is contact tracing. Um, so we when we start to see, I think, positive rates below about 10%, that says we're doing a pretty reasonable, that there's a reasonable testing capacity. So now what we need is we need the ability that if somebody does test positive, um, we can go out and make contact with everybody who they have been around for, I think the metric we're using is more than 15 minutes in the previous 48 hours-ish. And what that lets us do is it lets us find people while they are totally asymptomatic, um, make sure that they are supported to self-quarantine and prevents them from transmitting to other folks. So it lets us break off that chain of transmission before it starts and before it accelerates. Got it. And so let's talk about the positive positive rate for a second. So you mm -hmm. mentioned 10 percent. The county has been reporting about three or four percent now consistently mm -hmm. for a while, which I think I've come to understand means if you have a low positive rate, you can be reasonably sure you have a handle on how widespread the disease is. Is that fair? I think so. I think there is there is so much that we are still learning about this, but I do think if you see, um, so I, I've been keeping an eye on this and I've been seeing that the number of new cases each day seems to be remaining pretty steady, even as the number of tests go up. And that is a reasonable indication that the, the, um, the prevalence, I should say the incidence rate that we're seeing is probably about right. The other thing that is um, worth keeping an eye on to verify that is the number of people who are who are dying of COVID-19 each day, because that is easier to catch or to see in a lot of ways. And that number has also been holding steady for a while. So it it seems it seems likely if I couldn't swear to it, um, that that three to five percent might be about um, about our current prevalence in the county. We had a county supervisor, Jim Desmond, talk about uh, that death rate in particular, mm -hmm. and he he kept he he decided to make a point that only six of the say 210 or so people who have died from uh, COVID actually died from COVID alone. That it was mm -hmm. you know that everyone else had underlying conditions. And my first reaction to that is the number of underlying conditions is just really prevalent in the community. There's a lot of people who have mm -hmm. high blood pressure and stuff. Just mm -hmm. this seems like a, and I don't think they deserve to die. I don't think they're like on their way to death. And and so if this caused that, then that's something to keep in in mind. What do you think of when, when something like that is said that the death rate, you know, should be boiled down even further to these just few who are specifically affected by only COVID at that, COVID-19 at that moment? I, um, I would question the, the utility of, of doing that, of boiling things down to six instead of hundreds or thousands. Um, because what, what, what does that actually, what, I don't know what information that would give us that is more useful. So everybody has, we have a vast spectrum of human health and human behavior, right? Like everybody has something going on. Um, and I don't know that it would be accurate to say, well, this person died of 
um, asthma when they actually died of COVID-19, right? Um, and I, I think that there is, of course, there is always an urge to want to reason why you and your family are safe. Why, you know, those other people got sick, but they had something else going on and therefore this can't affect us. And I think that's a really reasonable human urge um, to come up with reasons why it won't affect you and you're okay. But I think the truth is we are still learning a lot about this disease. And while um, pre-existing conditions definitely do put you at higher risk, I don't think somebody was going to pass away the next day because they had cardiovascular disease and yet today their family doesn't have them. And I think it's important to count them correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, move into some questions. But first, I think it might set it up well. You you talked a lot about risk uh, management of risk. You yourself talked about how you have a, I guess, a toddler, right? Two and a half year mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you decided to bring uh, a, a babysitter in to work with you so you can continue to get your job done, which seems important mm -hmm. now. Uh, Trying. <laughs> <laughs> seems like of all the jobs that need to be getting done, yours is probably... Uh, up on the top of the list. So what um, what made you go through that risk assessment and how are you telling people they should manage their risks as far as, you know, seeing people, bringing babysitters in, going to see the grandparents, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting question because there's two things that we have to balance, right? We have to think about how to keep ourselves individually and our family safe, but also because... Um, this is an infectious disease. And a lot of the times we don't know if we are infected unless we have very recently gotten the test. And even then we don't know what happened five minutes after that. Um, our behaviors, our choices also affect the people around us. And I think it's really important to keep that tension in mind. So I myself, for my family, um, for about six weeks we did. We, my husband and I traded off. Um, I was with my my two and a half year old until nap time and he was with her post nap time and we kind of limped along and did our best because I, to me it was really important not to be a link in a transmission chain. And we and we had the ability to do that. And so I wanted to, to do my part and make sure that nobody else got sick um, because of something I did. Um, after about five or six weeks that stopped being really tenable for us. Um, and so we did talk about it quite a lot and we decided um, to ask a neighbor, um, a 16 year old neighbor to, to babysit for us. And we do try and be really thoughtful about that in large part because we want to be, we want to protect her family. Um, I'm not going anywhere besides my deserted office. My husband never leaves the house, but we wanna make sure that we are not affecting her family. Um, and that was a really frank conversation that we had with her and with her um, parents to make sure that everybody knew. And we kind of, we figured that it is, it, it seems possible that small children have lower viral loads, although they are very damp. Um, our babysitter is um, younger and we just, we decided as a collective set of families that that was an okay risk for us, but it wasn't, it was not 0% risk, Yeah. but it was, the trade-off was worth it to us. Okay, let's take some questions. Uh, Wendy Wheatcroft wrote, kids and playdates with friends. What, how should you analyze that risk? I think, so we know that um, you can't just, we know that you can't stay in your house forever. We know that we cannot stay completely isolated. Obviously, if everybody did that for 14 days, this might be done, but that's not going to happen. It's just not feasible. Um, if the safest way that you can socialize with somebody else is to stay, is to do it outside at least six feet away with masks if you can and no touching of the same things or one another, which isn't like fun. That's not as fun as like having brunch on a Sunday or like a potluck, but it's still better than sitting in your house alone. Yeah, I think kids are hard, right? How do you explain social distancing to a two year old? Um, kids want to hug one another. They want to hug the adults in their lives. Um, and so we did visit with a friend at a distance outside the other day. And it was frankly really heartbreaking that my my two-year-old who, who adores his friend couldn't give her a hug. And I think you as a parent have to kind of make your best judgment. Are there enough people who are already in a household with um, the kid to sort of prevent that from happening? Um, or are your kids old enough to really understand that? Um, it's hard. And you know what? 
it might not be possible, like people make mistakes, right? It's not, it might not be possible to do that 100%, but as long as you are do, doing your best in the 90%, that's still great. So would you go to a party in somebody's backyard where you brought your own food and you stayed reasonably distant, but you know, the kids might run into each other every once in a while, that sort of thing? No, I wouldn't do that. No, no. <laughs> um, that's good. Okay, let's take a different angle. We had another commenter who was, I think, more on the skeptical side. Mm -hmm. uh, as testing shows that more and more people were infected with, uh, without symptoms and that people are having life-threatening problems with COVID are people with pre-existing health issues. Is it safe to say we went too far in our response? Do you think we went too far? Mm -mm. I think there's data coming out that just in that literally tens of thousands of lives have been saved in California. And I think that could have been um, somebody that any one of us cares about. And I think that um, the this this is not this is not too far to save my mom, right? This is not too far to save your cousin or your neighbor or somebody you care about or you. We know that people with pre-existing conditions, people who are older are at higher risk, but we also know people in their 20s and 30s are getting this. We're seeing uh, strokes, we're seeing strange and kind of really concerning syndromes in young children. So the the probability is higher with older folks, but it's not zero with younger folks. Mm -hmm. There was a related question I'll pull up here. Uh, uh, why are, um, you know, we forced to stay at home, um, you know, for these 0.2%? And one thing I, I always point out is it's not just people who die, too. Like, uh, people get very sick. And it's not just the deaths that we're avoiding, although that's a big part. It's, it's you know, I know people personally who have been in the hospital, had to go to ICU. Mm -hmm. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a, a big consequence beyond just the deaths mm -hmm. that we want to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, and we don't, we don't quite know the long-term effects of this, right? We know that um, it's a very long recovery. People are talking about months later, they're still short of breath, they can't walk. Um, we don't quite know what this does to us, but we know it's not great. And it's not something that you yourself want to get. Um, and I think that, it is a reasonable question to say, you know, if only if only 200 people in the county are going, could potentially die from this, then why do I have to wear a mask in Costco? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's a fair thing to ask. Um, but I also think we do a lot of things as a society pr to protect one another, right? We have all agreed you cannot do six shots and then go driving, even if you think drinking makes you a better driver. We have agreed that's not allowed. We have all agreed you have to drive your car at a certain speed sober. Um, and we do these things, we put these restrictions on ourselves to make all of us safer. I would also suggest that um, one thing that does affect you is you do not want the hospitals being overwhelmed. So we have been in this shelter in place, not necessarily to protect individuals, to, but to protect our health system. And I think that hasn't been emphasized enough. You do not want your health system so overwhelmed with COVID cases that you can't go to the ER if you have a broken arm or your kid can't go to the ER if they spike a fever in the middle of the night. So this is actually, it's not for the 0.2%, it is for all of us who need doctors and nurses to be available for us when we are sick of anything. Yeah. Um, as we start to see, like the hospitals seem to be in a position of, they could use some more business now, the more volume uh, there's, uh, is, is it, it, I think, from what I heard from you earlier, yeah, it's okay to start loosening as they've proven they have they have that um, capacity. But mm -hmm. um, but but we're going to have this long term sort of equilibrium with this disease in a way. Uh, we have a lot of questions about masks. Here's a cool colorful one: Am I an a hole if I run in the streets without a mask? A lot of people no. are. <laughs> okay. Quickly and six feet away from people. It's fine. I don't know how you would go for a run in a mask. Um, I. You know, I I was a runner for many years, and then I had a toddler. I, how can you? I don't know how you could run in a mask. It's fine. Stay six you, feet away from people and be quick. Yeah, I I put one around my neck just to show that I'm like there or something <laughs> like is it like a signaling. But yeah, it makes so you you the point of a mask is if you're around other people, put on a mask, and it'll keep you not only from uh, you know coughing into their into their space, but also it keeps you from touching your own face and and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, let's do another question. Uh, this came in. This was an interesting one. As you talk about know your status, uh, he says um, it came in on Twitter. If we 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 normally go to Montana in July, we drive there, we hang out with my parents. Uh, they're in their 80s. Dad has COPD. If we got tested before leaving, drove there with minimal stops, stayed isolated with my folks, is that still a bad idea? And I and I know you know full disclosure, you're not going to be able to give him a perfect answer. But how would you no. go about analyzing that risk? Mm -hmm. I will tell you how I have thought about that in my in my personal life and what I would do. Um, and then I would suggest that you do your research and talk to your parents too. So for us, pre-babysitter, um, when I knew where everybody in my house was at all times, um, and that it didn't even involve grocery shopping. We have a lot of subscription services now. I did, I would visit with my parents. So um, my parents came down for Mother's Day and it was lovely. Um, we went and saw them for my mom's birthday. And that was because I knew they weren't going anywhere because I kept yelling at them to not go anywhere. I knew we weren't going anywhere and I felt reasonable about that. Um, now that we have somebody else coming into our household, now that we're connected to a broader network, mm -hmm. I would be a lot more cautious about that. And I would not visit my parents, probably unless everybody had gotten a test. We waited four to five days. We did it again just to be sure it didn't catch us early. We waited a couple more days and then we went. Um, I, I would feel comfortable with that level of risk. But my parents are sort of younger, older, so to speak, um, and don't have any underlying conditions. I think everybody needs to um, weigh out what their personal risk scenario is and have a really frank conversation about what your parents in particular are comfortable with. That's fascinating. So do you think, so you've, you've followed HIV for so many years, the, the test, is, is, is that kind of testing available right now for HIV, that sort of rapid, you know, uh, weekly kind of thing? Yeah, so um, it's actually amazing. You can, there are, um, you can get a test, usually a finger prick, and you can see your results in minutes. Um, it's, it's really fast. It's really widely accessible, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. If anybody on here is thinking about getting an HIV test, Planned Parenthood is a great place. There's a lot of resources in the county. Um, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. and, we, and you can be linked to resources pretty quickly. And I would Fantastic. love to see something like that for COVID, like a fingerprint, a cheek swab, it shows up purple or blue and you know when you can go about your business. So if you had a, if it, let's say a lot of us are thinking about summer camps and one of the things that caught my eye, you said like summer camps should all be outside. Let's get kids outside. So I think you're okay in some way with kids being together, maybe outside or with some precautions, you go inside, you wash your hands, that's it. Is, mm -hmm. is that a, a fair summary? Yeah, so we, my husband and I talked about this. We know that um, childcare is probably going to reopen fairly soon, at which point it's going to be a bit of a switch for those of us who have had two-year-olds and been struggling, and those of you who have had eight-year-olds who can entertain themselves a little bit. Um, yeah, and I, sense. and we decided that we were comfortable with um, sending our kid to childcare. Um, but one thing that I think is another role that testing can play and that parents can do to be really responsible and make sure childcare stays open is parents knowing their status, right? You want to be able to um, pull your kid out of the pool quickly if you think anything's going to go wrong. So for me, for childcare, for three-year-olds, um, I would say the more you can be outside, the better. Every day is slip and slide day, right? Like every day is nature walk day. And that's because we know that the more ventilation, the better. Um, we know it gives um, teachers and staff fewer things that they have to disinfect if the kids have been running around on a lawn. Um, that's just less work for them. And it keeps the teachers safer too, even though children are, again, damp. And I say that with a lot of love for mine. <laughs> Uh, let's take another question. Morgan Justice Black says, should we continue to avoid routine appointments, dentists, dermatologists, just because they are back open? Does that mean necessarily that we should be going if we don't have to? I think one, th I think it's important. You can check with your provider about what their procedures are. I know a lot of pediatricians are really worried that people have been putting off well child visits. So there's some concern that kids aren't getting their vaccines for vaccine preventable viruses because parents are concerned about the, va the vaccine, the one that is not vaccine preventable right now. Um, so definitely I know, um, 
um, take your kid to their well child visit. Absolutely. I think a lot of places do have procedures in place. I know at UCSD, they are moving um, again to mass testing. Um, so providers take a test frequently. I can't remember the exact interval. Um, people who are going to be in the hospital longer are asked to do a drive through test before they're going to be there. So if it is something that is important to your health and peace of mind, I I pers if I had a dermatologist appointment for like a mole that was worrying me and I knew what precautions my dermatologist was taking, I would do it. I am also flossing a lot more right now because I'm a bad person. And I don't <laughs> and I don't go to the dentist as much as I should. And I'm going to wait for a vaccine to go to the dentist because there's a lot of mouths breathing right there. So I floss yeah. more now. <laughs> yeah. PSA floss a lot. <laughs> I had to get a root canal like 10 years ago and it still is the biggest, it's such a trauma. It's just the worst uh, day uh, I had in a long time. Okay. Uh, one of your colleagues at UC San Diego or, or in at Scripps, at least, uh, Helen Amanda Fricker, uh, uh, she asked about UC San Diego's Return to Learn program. You just mentioned uh, mm -hmm. some of these things um, and whether UC San Diego can consider advising school districts uh, on you know, the, their employees depend on these school districts on the full mm -hmm. opening of schools. Uh, could UC, UCSD lead the way here? Um, so many of us are terrified about what's going to happen in schools. You heard me talking earlier, the, the uh, drumbeat out of the school leadership is that it's not looking good for opening in the fall. It could be even worse than it is now as far as distance learning. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just uh, really troubling. If you were talking to a school district, what would you need to know or what would you what would you be telling them in order to help them think through this really big problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I think this is one place where um, the more that we can sort of think collaboratively and across um, disciplines, the better. So I can give good public health advice, but there's also a lot of things to consider around like social and developmental issues. Should people with around three-year-olds wear masks? I mean, maybe like that might not be developmentally appropriate for smaller children, right? I think, so Return to Learn is an amazing program. It's really exciting. Um, at UCSC, we're doing um, a huge push to try and test anywhere between 60 and 90% of our campus community on pretty frequent intervals around once a month. And we're kind of piloting that right now and getting a sense of if we can do it. Um, I'll give you a, a small spoiler alert on that data. It's going to be easier if we can do it with a spit test and a massive nasal swab. Um, <laughs> people are going to want to do one of those more frequently than the other. Yeah, no kidding. And I think that one of the things that schools can do and can think about is the size of a network that is connected through a classroom or a school. It's actually quite a lot of people. And the more quickly we can let people within that network know if there's a risk, the more quickly we can sort of um, break off a transmission chain within that network, the more um, the majority of people can, can keep um, can keep using the school or the more the school can stay open. And I think that's going to be really uncomfortable, right? Like nobody wants to be the parent who ugh, now you're stuck at home because your kid licked a flagpole and like you can't go to work. Um, but better you and your kid for a few days than the entire school for a month, right? Yeah. So that gets back to your point that testing is just the crux of everything. It is at the heart of all of what we want to get done if we want to manage uh, the outbreak and and con and continue with some semblance of life. And so, you know, at schools, what you're basically implying is some sort of rapid and available testing regimen that can allow us to spot one of these things without paralyzing the entire system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think testing and, and contact tracing. Um, and I think that will, the contact tracing in particular is going to be key. Um, just testing requires um, people's sort of goodwill to remove themselves and to let all their all their friends know. Um, but testing and contact tracing means that somebody gets in touch with you when you test positive and then they reach out to everybody you've been around anonymously. They say somebody you know has tested positive. Here's where you can get a test. Here are resources for you to take care of yourself. By the way, who have you been around? And we need a lot of that. All right, I've got a question here. Um, will you feel comfortable eating on a restaurant patio in the next few weeks. So there's a lot of restaurants trying to figure out if they can get open and they're seeing the outdoors as an opportunity that um, you know they, they can't fit that many people anymore in their building, 
What if we close some streets, get people outside, uh, that sort of thing? Would you feel comfortable going to a restaurant like that? Yeah, you know, my so my brother works is a is a trained chef and has worked in the restaurant industry for many years. A lot of my family members have, and my heart just goes out to restaurant staff. And I know just what razor thin margins they work on. Um, I personally would not. I will continue to order takeout once in, once or twice a week because a I'm tired, and b I want these restaurants to still exist, and then I would enjoy them in my backyard or in a park six feet away from other people if I did want to eat it somewhere besides my living room that I'm sick of. But I would not go to a restaurant in person right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also and I think that. Some of that is for me, but some of that is also for the wait staff, right? Like, again, that's a situation where it's the people who work there are going to be constantly exposed, the more people who go, even if you yourself only risk a one-time exposure. So how do you uh, think about that in your mind then? Do you think it's okay that they're opening like that right now? Or do you think it shouldn't, It, it you know, that's my, I guess, is it okay that they're open as long as people can just decide how to measure their own risk? or? Do you think we've really crossed the line there that we should be worried about? I think okay is sort of, you could, so you could think about okay sort of epidemiologically or morally or in a policy way, right? Um, yeah. In a perfect world where everybody has paid sick leave and there's universal income and I don't have to make dinner every night, no, I would leave restaurants closed. Um, I do worry about the staff in both directions, both in terms of the restaurant closing and them losing their jobs, but also if a restaurant reopens and somebody does not feel comfortable um, going into a very small kitchen, and many of them are very small and very close, and I'm given to understand there's a lot of shouting, which we know is a bad idea, um, I would feel really uncomfortable going into that space as a staff member. But if the restaurant opens, then you also can't really apply for unemployment. And so I, I have concerns about the restaurants reopening, both because staff can't protect themselves and because like transmission wise, it's not a great plan. Yeah. So that does seem like we're, we're watching all these restrictions get boiled off into um, don't gather inside and shout or scream or okay. sing same. And and uh, otherwise things we can maybe work with, but there's a lot of things that we're finding out involve getting inside and shouting, screaming, or mm -hmm. singing, mm -hmm. and 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 so like our life, you know, if we can't get it outside, it feels uh, uh, really uncomfortable. So yeah, I, I agree with that. It's such a hard issue because you know as as successful as these efforts have been in controlling and protecting the hospital's capacity and and all that it it does breed a a impatience you know like life we have to we have to live with this somehow we have to continue to operate we have to be able to feed people and take care of our families mm -hmm. and build businesses and keep employees around and all that and so i guess is there a broader way you could help people think through those those anxieties right now, like um, what we're trying to do uh, and what, you know, what it might look like to live uh, in this new equilibrium with the threat, uh, because it's it's really getting hard on people. And I, I think in a lot of ways they're they're over it. I'm over it, too. I would like this to end, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, it's so hard. Um, this is this is not where we. Ex this is not what we expected to be doing on May twentieth, twenty twenty, right? Like I'm sure a lot of people were planning to do something real fun for Memorial Day, um, and this is not where we want to be. And it, um, frankly, sucks. Um, and, but I do think it's going to be the normal for a while. I do want to say it's going to end. It will. This is not forever, but it might be for a while. Um, I think that. We have seen, um, for example, the SARS outbreak in, when was that, 2003, 2004? Um, that was a really similar virus. I think it probably spread a little slower, but we got that, well, not us, like Hong Kong, many countries got that under control using just really old fashioned techniques, contact tracing, isolation, making sure people were supported when they were isolated. That, that can work, right? Like New Zealand does not have cases right now. Wuhan did get their cases under control. Um, kids are going to school in Singapore. 
um, people are eating at restaurants in Germany. And so there are absolutely things that can be done. Um, and they might feel stressful and inconvenient. It is weird to wear a mask just to walk down the street. Um, it is really unpleasant to, I don't know, like all your groceries are somebody throws them in your car while you sit in the curb. But these things are the things that are necessary to get back to normal someday. And a lot of them are sort of individual level efforts and also advocating um, at the policy level for things that the data suggest are going to be the policies that let us get back to normal sooner. Like testing. Like testing. <laughs> and contact tracing. More of them. You know, I... Um, because contact tracing is kind of my big my big push right now, um, I, I kind of went and did some of the math on like how many contact tracers we would need. Um, so for example, in Wuhan, they had about 81 people per 100,000 members of the population. And there have been different varieties of that. I think um, New Zealand had eight. But in San Diego, to get something even approaching, um, to get a, a, a number of, a, a level of contact tracing that I think would let us feel comfortable eating at a restaurant and a patio, sending our kids to school, um, maybe visiting with our parents or grandparents if they were younger and didn't have underlying diseases. I I think we would need something like 40 to 80 people per 100,000. And, um, you know, in the city, that's somewhere between 600 and 1,200 people hired as contact tracers. In the county, that's about somewhere between 1,300 and 2,700. And I think the county is hiring 400 now yeah so they've been, they've contact been tracing about, yeah they've been <laughs> they've been talking about 500 as the the goal they were getting to so yeah that's that's maybe double or or more so um okay well a uh, couple more if you don't mind you okay for a mm -hmm. few minutes okay yeah. uh we had uh carrie schneider come in she said if if the wait staff at a restaurant had n95 masks like if they're wearing masks i saw a video out of china that showed um uh, people at a, a restaurant, just full PPE, as though they were in an ICU uh, handing out food. Uh, is that going to do it? Is that going to make it okay? Is, is is Would that make you feel more comfortable? Um, you know, I, this is sort of speculation, right? Like, I right. would imagine that wearing an N95 would reduce risk for staff more. But there's still, you know, you you touch things um, and we know that the virus can can sort of like linger on stuff for 24 to 72 hours. So you touch things, you touch your face, there's still risk there. Um, I also worry that we don't have enough N95 to start using them for restaurants as well as, um, as healthcare settings. Um, and so I personally think that um, paid sick leave and um, sort of policies to support people until it was actually safer would be better than passing out N95s to wait staffs. And again, mm -hmm. I think that there is a lot of shouting and it's really hot in the kitchens based on my brother's stories. And I don't know how well that would work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, your last chance, if you have any questions, there's so many questions about kids specifically um, and, and how they spread it. Do they spread it to adults? Um, and from what you've been able to look at with the data, do we know if kids are a, a lot less vulnerable? It does feel like most of the data indicates they are, but, mm -hmm. but what, do we, what would you need to see to know that, yes, that is true, you know, that that's like something, not just outlying information? I, I think that's really the million dollar question. And the problem is we just don't know. Um, it's, it's, Sorry, or sorry, COVID is, is unusual in that it seems to be affecting kids a little bit less. And I have deep gratitude that that's the case. Um, but it also means we're really not sure what's going on. There are things you can do, especially as kids start to congregate, to get a sense of um, are kids just not infectious, like sick, but not infectious. Um, maybe we haven't seen a lot of pediatric cases because a lot of these outbreaks started during school breaks. So maybe as kids go back to school in France and Singapore, we will start to see outbreaks. And we saw that in France very recently. We just don't know. Um, one thing you can actually do that's weird um, and gross, but also kind of great, is you can find um, uh, RNA pieces in fecal matter and poop. And um, I don't know, a daycare could send all their dirty diapers to the county and we could see like how many of those, <laughs> how yeah. many of those have COVID in them. 
Yeah. You can pick your county supervisor you want to send the dirty diaper to. It's up the, to you. The poop tracers. Yeah. The poop tracers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Could be a brigade of the contact tracers. <laughs> um, okay, good. Well, uh, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. I, I see a lot of people uh, grateful for doing this. Um, have you found any great resources or things uh, to read about this or maybe tapping into your experience uh, with HIV, how, oh, actually, sorry, I came up with another question yeah. that came up. Uh, this one came up, I wanted to remember, I got back to was, how long did it take for HIV tests to get to the point where they were that available? Like, uh, uh, do you, do we know how long it might take to get to the point where we could have the kind of testing that you're talking about? I mean, if, if that's mm -hmm. the goal, that would be uh, really nice. That is such a good question. I don't know the exact answer. I do know that HIV is actually, um, in many ways, the story of the science behind HIV is a story of phenomenal community advocacy from the LGBT community around the world. And we have fast tests now, we have the treatments we have now because of pushing and advocating from that community. Um, if anybody's interested in some really deep nerdery um, about sort of the place where science meets politics, um, there's a book called How to Survive a Plague that's just a massive tome, but describes how we got to where we are with HIV. And it's it's it was it's politics just as much as it is science. That's fascinating. Uh, okay, um, I commute uh, use a in a bus. I wear a face mask. Is there anything else I can do to protect myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I should say, first of all, that the mask is actually for the mask. I'm so glad you're wearing a mask. I really appreciate that. And that is predominantly protecting other people from you, especially the cloth ones. So those keep your exhalations from landing on the bus. So I'm really glad that they're um, the fact that the public transportation is asking everybody to wear masks means there's fewer um, bugs for you to pick up yourself. If I was to take a bus, I would uh, bring a lot of hand sanitizer with me. Um, and I would sit next to an open window. Um, that would be my best bet. And then I would be really conscientious about washing my hands um, as soon as I could after I got off the bus. That, those would be the measures I would take. Got it. Well, Dr. Fielding Miller, I really appreciate it. It seems like a lot of people are really grateful you came on. Uh, uh, one su suggests maybe next month we check in with you. Would that be all right? <laughs> Sure. No, I'm happy to, All especially right. if daycare is open. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. We'll have more time. All right. Dr. Uh, Rebecca Fielding Miller from UC San Diego. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. All right. Bye. Okay. Uh, well, uh, send any more questions you have. Maybe I can follow up with her. I've been doing a piece uh, right now about the, the great reopening in San Diego as we go through some of these issues. And uh, you know, I'm going to talk, uh, put some of her comments in there. I just think uh, uh, there's so many open questions. It does feel like we are getting to the point where we're boiling off all of these restrictions to you can't gather inside. So you can't gather inside for a funeral. You can't go to a, there was an outbreak in a curling event in Canada. There was a um, uh, uh, outbreak in Chicago where a guy, one guy went to a birthday party and a funeral and infected 10 people out of that. Three people died. Um, you know, so these indoor congregate, you know, getting together inside um, and then and then talking loudly, singing a choir practice in, in Washington, similar. So as we boil off these restrictions, uh, you know, into that, don't get inside and, and, and sing and talk and such. What does that mean for our life? Should we bring more things outside? Um, should we have concerts at uh, at the at the. Um, uh, sports arena parking lot where everybody's in their car or sitting outside their car or something. Is there a way to have life that goes on in a different way outside? Um, you know, gyms, uh, Texas opened gyms on Monday, but gym, gyms are uh, restricted to 25% occupancy. Even in Texas, the showers are closed. Uh, seems like showers you would want to have to clean things, but I understand. So, um, so a gym or a restaurant opening at 25% capacity is uh, a really, I mean, does that function? Does that even work? So if that's what we have to do to keep functioning, it seems like there has to be a complete redesign of how we might want to go about doing those things. Um, so uh, maybe move it outside, maybe spread people out even more. Um, so lots to follow there. Uh, again, check out voiceofshandiego.org. 
Uh, all of this uh, investigative work is made possible by uh, the 3,400 or so people who donate to Voice San Diego, along with the corporate sponsors and the foundations that make this possible. We have investigative reporters out there looking on all three of these major fronts with this virus, the healthcare front, the government front, how it's affecting governments and how governments are reacting. We still have 1,100 people living in the convention center downtown. Where are they going to go after this? Um, those are questions that our investigative reporters are following, plus the economy today. We did the story about the tourism industry and other places as they readjust and reopen and try to uh, build back jobs and businesses with such incredibly uh, astonishing and terrifying levels of unemployment. So we're following that, plus just following all the stuff we were following, schools, um, uh, quality education and other issues. All of our investigative reporters are out there doing that. And then our people are uh, trying to make sense of it and helping me create products uh, like this, like Voice San Diego at Home. So special shout out to uh, Megan Wood, who's helped me put this together and help master this. Uh, one other bit for those of you who follow Voice of San Diego, you know that PolitiFest is a big deal for us. It's our annual summit in the fall um, uh, about politics. And 2020 was supposed to be the biggest ever. It was uh, it was going to be such an amazing uh, um, day for us. We were going to have major debates and tons of, we thought it would be the biggest um, event we ever had. And, and then this happened. And so at first we were really taken aback, but we started to uh, sit back and realize that there's maybe a way that this could be the most diverse, most widely attended PolitiFest ever. So we're starting to put together a um, one week experience instead. We'll have debates from all over the region. You can log in for what you want or what you don't want. Mayor's debates, county supervisors, ballot measures. We'll do some explanatory work and we'll do lots of things, but it'll be online uh, and we are excited. I think it. I think it could be huge. We could have, you know, when you have a, a an event at USD in Linda Vista, and you invite somebody to come debate like East County issues or South Bay, there it just feels a little geographically mismatched. And so we don't have that problem anymore. <laughs> so thank you, <laughs> lock and uh, stay at home order. So we're we're figuring out a new way to do that and we think it's going to be huge so stay tuned that's probably going to start september 28th 2020 uh, for that week and then we'll we'll uh climax that saturday with some uh really good uh content and discussion so stay tuned for more information on that and again our staff has really um uh, been more relevant more excited more productive than ever based on just trying to be a service to the community so if you support any of this uh even if uh, even if it's just $5 or whatever, it really helps our numbers and helps our case to other people. Go to VOSD.org slash give. That's VOSD.org slash give. And uh, again, if you don't know much about Voice of San Diego, let's take a, a second and um, and go through just how uh, some of this works. So, um, so this is... Uh, this is the site. Um, so, oops. So let me get this here. Um, so uh, this is Voice of San Diego. Today's our major stories about the tourism plan. Uh, yesterday's was about schools needing, uh, are saying they need uh, far more cash to be able to open in the fall. Um, you can check all that out. Uh, this is our daily testing um, uh, tracker so we've been really trying to work uh to make sure that the region fall you know you just heard how big a deal testing is uh so this is how the testing uh, uh has played out over seven day averages over the last uh i guess nine weeks or so or eight weeks and so we're getting better we're getting up to the the pledged uh need which is about this we need to get to um 5300 tests per day to hit the governor's goal on that so we are, have decided to really focus on making sure to hold them accountable on that. The best way to follow Voice of San Diego, though, is with our morning report. It comes out every morning. Uh, you can go to voicesandiego.org and sign up right here. And um, that's our, we're going to have links to this kind of stuff, uh, links to our best stories, and then links to other things that we think you should care about in the community. It's written in a conversational way, and we think it's uh, it's really good and 
good way to follow San Diego politics. So go to voicesandiego.org, check that out. Fridays, we put out our podcast uh, with me and Sarah Libby and Andrew Keats. And uh, uh, that's uh, been an important part of our product lineup for a long time. So we do a ton of things. And if you support it, uh, please consider going to Voice San Diego, VOSD.org slash give. Okay. Thank you all. And thank you to Dr. Fielding uh, Miller for coming aboard. And I uh, really appreciate your support of Voice. And stay tuned for Friday. We go on uh, Voice San Diego at home on Instagram at the Voice of San Diego feed on Instagram. And then I'll be back here on Monday. And so I will talk to you 